Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm with Wikibon. I'm with my co-host, Jeff Kelly. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angles, wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the MIT Information Quality Symposium. Dr. David Levine is here. He's the Vice President of Informatics and Medical Director of Comparative Data and Informatics at UHC. We're going to unpack the data quality, information quality issue within healthcare. David, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So, talk a little bit about your role at, at UHC. We'll start there and then we'll dig into it. Well, as the Vice President of Informatics and the Medical Director, I oversee our risk adjustment process. We risk adjust inpatient mortality, length of stay, and direct cost for our academic medical centers. Uh, it's, uh, since it's a very specialized patient population, it warrants um, the ability to really look at that population and capture those risks where the clinicians will both believe in the data and be able to take action on the data. And then additionally, really my overarching role other than the risk adjustments is really in clinician engagement in the data. So it's both creating new tools for them to utilize the data and really working with individual chief medical officers, chief information medical officers with their data so that it's more usable so that they can drive performance improvement. Okay, and, then, and that's measured as you know, saving lives and doing so in an efficient, you know, cost efficient way. Right, saving lives, decreasing uh, complications uh, in the most efficient, uh, cost efficient way. Okay, so, um, so talk a little bit about what you're doing here and your, your role at this conference. So at this conference I was invited to speak on the evolution of the UHC risk models. And what I mean by that is that you know, there's a number of different risk adjustment methodologies out there, but UHC's risk adjustment, by being specialized for the most complex patients in the healthcare setting, have really um, continued to evolve as health data has evolved over the years. So we had very limited data back 10, 15 years ago when the risk models really started springing up. And now with the, all the big data, all the data that's available, really taking the conference attendees through UHC's journey and how we've worked with academic medical centers to continue to improve the quality of our risk prediction and the usability of the models, both on a data quality and then on a face validity on the user's ability to believe in the data and to be able to take action on the data. So I would imagine, you know, as a practitioner of the sort of risk assessment over the, over let's say, let's take the last decade, you know, before the big data explosion. I mean, there's always been big data. We've talked about that a lot. But I would imagine you were making continuous improvement. Maybe not, but I'd like to you to talk about that. What kind of, you know, trend lines you saw and then how it was affected by the, by the, the, the volume of data, I mean, in particular, you know, the events of, you know, the early web days when, when you know, Google essentially exploded <laughs> <laughs> our information, our corpus of data that we have to deal with. Were you making consistent progress and did, it, did the volume of data affect that or were you able to, you know, plow through that? Um, you know, has, the hospitals have been making consistent progress even with the more limited data in the, in the past, but what was really tough is it was really hard to measure, and there were only s hmm. very small measures that you could do, such as inpatient mortality was something that we could always capture. Right. Length of stay we could capture. Even cost data was really hard to capture the individual data elements. And actually, even within those pieces, to be able to risk adjust and predict and to um, modify behavior based on acuity of patients, when initially we might have only got nine diagnoses as a maximum allowed for the sickest patients, and now in our database we can take in 99 diagnoses and 99 procedures and be able to work with that within the database to do better prediction. The analytics around that and actionability has really increased. Okay, so um, you, you said you talked about the cost elements were hard to, 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 to predict. Is that because they were so distributed in nature or did you get a p true picture of the total cost? Or yeah, I th cost has still been the, true cost has been the toughest nut to crack. And I think that medicine has been you know, slower behind other industries in having databases that are able to talk with each other and to be able to share that data. Uh, hospitals are looking at their bottom lines, being able to tie individual things to an individual patient have been a tough, um, tough thing for our members. So I put, a, I have a knee, if I had a knee replacement, knowing exactly what implant I put in my knee on what day, the hospitals know they use that implant and how many they bought and what they bought it at, but they don't know that the implant that might be in my knee was the one that they bought at X number of dollars. I think the ability of data expansion is not, we're not there yet, but I think now the ability to get it has um, increased significantly. I think the challenge is um, the data explosion has come where our members have put in, uh, and all hospitals have put in a number of different information systems to solve the clinical day-to-day. -day. 
those systems still don't talk to each other in a consistent fashion always and still to bring the data elements together. So what's sitting in my OR operating system that may have material management data doesn't always talk with my clinical data repository. And I think that's still the challenge around cost. That yeah, we and, and, and Jeff, you and I have talked about this. I don't think it's unique to healthcare, but I think it's a, a, a bigger issue because of what's at stake. You know? Well, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and perhaps not unique, but could you talk a little bit about why that is in, in the healthcare space, that systems don't tend to talk to each other? Um, I, I, you, you were a uh, you know, practicing physician uh, before coming to UHC, so you know, talk about your experience in the field and, and uh, maybe the frustrations you might have had in terms of working with disparate data sources that just couldn't communicate, um, and, and, and kind of the ecosystem, how did that, how did that evolve? Um, yeah, I mean it, it definitely as you know, practicing, I practice in one of the busiest emergency departments in the United States, um, in Chicago, and um, you know, patients came in with limited information that they knew about oneself. You know, the toughest thing you know, initially you know, before the data explosion and electronic health records is, you had to rely on uh, you know, paper records, which especially in an emergency, in a trauma, in a fast situation, in an emergency department, if they were even able to find the records, medical records, to be able to get it up to me in a timely manner for me to leaf through and find was obviously a huge challenge. Um, early on, what we actually started doing was scanning old emergency department charts and at least having an electronic poor person's uh, version of the electronic health record. Even that was like reading handwritten charts and notes and finding things, and that was only a piece of someone's data from their emergency department. I didn't know what happened to them, the inpatient or in future states. What's happened in that, as a, in a good way, people want data and want, we want to capture all these data elements. I think in the health profession, you know, a number of very good vendors have sprung up and provided electronic health record solutions or other solutions within the other specialty areas, but it's still been very proprietary, and so. Um, the vet, there's not an incentive for the vendor's products at one place to work and talk with a different vendor's product at another place. A health ex information exchange will help drive the exchange of some of this information going forward, but not all of it. But then I think the other tough thing in medicine, and it has some, um, it's similar in some industries, but not as much, is every place has their way of doing things. So. I wouldn't customize my electronic health record in the emergency department in a certain way, but it, my colleague at another emergency department that sees a bit of a different patient mix in their emergency department may want it in a, in a different way. And then the system, how do much do I make my system talk for my specialty versus being uniform even across my institution? And so it's really that balance of customization versus standardization that I think medicine came great guns and got really excited about the electronic revolution and they actually didn't take a step, and now it's beginning to take a step back and saying, oh, how do we normalize this? And that's why you see the springing up of all these individual data warehouses, the real true need for health information exchanges is sort of the correct that explosion. Yeah, and how do you actually adopt that in <laughs> into the organization? One of the things uh, that we, Jeff and I, when we were prepping last night, we noticed this is in addition in within UHC, and this had a direct effect on mortality, uh, models, all candidate variables are now required to be present on admission, whereas previously they just had to be present sometime uh, on Correct. admission. So how did that come about? How automated is that? Uh, how much friction does that cause <laughs> organizationally? Sure. Um, when we first brought on a present on admission, it was about three years ago, um, three or four years ago, it was um, controversial. Not controversial in the concept, but really in getting the providers to believe that that data was being captured properly in the record in the administrative claims data that was being sent to us. So as an example, um, if they didn't write some a, a past medical condition in a certain way in a certain place in the medical record, the coder could not pick it up. So even if the coder reading the chart knew that that probably existed prior to admission, they weren't allowed to code it. So there was a lot of um, buy-in early on and also a lot of um, catching up of best practices because Thankfully, present on admission, when it really took hold and we were able to use it, is when it got tied to reimbursement as well as quality measures. And unfortunately, money talks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, th our hospitals are incredibly still uh, interested in quality, but really the driver was when your reimbursement was affected. And so th those present on admissions were um, up your reimbursement for certain conditions as well as helping your clinical measures. That helped. But actually, we had to wait. The present on admission had been around for, a, we had to wait for it to be around and stable for two years before we could adopt it into our data sets as a, using it as a standard measure, because we wanted our members to be using it on an equal playing field that it really could have an apples to apples comparison and that we knew that was being used reliably and properly. Another example that we just recently added this year was actually DNR, the do not resu resuscitate order for certain models. Obviously hospitals have been writing DNR for a long time, you know, for the appropriate patients, but the actual ICD-9 code was only adopted 
in the recent past, and then again, we use two years of historic data to build our models. Our, mo our data that we're running is up-to-date data, but it's based on two years of historic data. We needed the historic data to catch up so that we had the proper model set to really know how that affected the prevalence of our mortality and um, length of stay and cost. Interesting. So I noticed, so one of your other um, responsibilities you mentioned is kind of helping develop the tools that physicians will actually use and, and nurses uh, and clinicians actually use to actually interact with their data, analyze data, things like that. Talk a little bit about that because, you know, one of the challenges um, that we've kind of heard anecdotally in the healthcare field is getting, uh, is adoption of the tools by the physicians themselves. They've got certain ways of doing things and potentially, uh, you know, are, are, are le less likely to adopt these kind of tools than maybe other types of, of workers. Um, what are you doing in terms of developing tools that will uh, entice physicians to actually use them? And what are some of the challenges and how are you overcoming those? Sure. Um, I think two key premises that we've been working at in the UHC and that have been sort of consistent with our overall philosophy is our database has always been open and transparent so that you can actually look at your hospital's data by name and look at our other members' data in comparison by name. So, you know, in a competitive market here, like in Boston, you know, if you're at Brigham and Women's, you can actually look at Mass General's or Tufts data by name. If you wanted, to, if you thought your competitors or someone that you wanted to compare to was more like on one of the uh, on the West Coast instead, you could do that, or you could see the whole database. And so we're leveraging that transparency. So in all our models and all our um, scoring of um, what gives you a red flag or a red dot and whatnot is all out there and transparent to the membership. The other thing is member engagement. So my risk adjustment team in building the models involves clinicians and statisticians from the membership. Um, so it's the transparency and actually the, it's not just me and my team in a box at UHC. Um, I think the other thing is key is that we really are, the, most of our people that work at UHC are clinicians, statisticians, people that have worked in the hospital. You know, I still see patients, uh, not at Cook County anymore, but uh, you know, still practice clinically. So when people talk to me about their experiences, I'm living those experiences as well as working on the quality piece of things. So that, that helps as well. And then I think the last thing is we, we don't just give a number. So your mortality data isn't just this, or your length of stay isn't this. All, every one of our data elements has at least one drill down, and most data elements where possible, you can drill down to the patient level. So very commonly when uh, working with a member and they're looking at some of the uh, individual clinician's data, he or she can actually get drilled down to those cases. And you know, sometimes there are things that, that weren't recorded properly or the attribution wasn't right. When they look, it's like, that wasn't my case. I don't know how that name got assigned to me and pulled in. And um, we're flexible with that, you know, with the transparency. So I think those are real keys mm -hmm. that help, is um, really knowing where the data is coming from, what the source is. We have never professed that our data is perfect. We try to make it the best that it can, but we're uh, also very open about where it's, where it still needs to go. And we're upfront with our membership of where our strategy is. So right now we're mainly administrative claims data. We know that the docs and myself as a user have you know, wanted clinical data. So we are actually w looking at ways now to um, automate it, bringing in lab values and EHR values beyond the coded administrative claims data. Statistically, it's only gonna improve the models probably about 5%. Face validity and you know, cl uh, clinicians really buying in and using it will be huge. So now they can really feel that they're p that person with that low hemoglobin is really recorded as, as being anemic versus if they circle the lab value with an arrow down, they're right. The coder would not be allowed to pick that up. They'd have to acknowledge it in more form than a symbol on a, on a, on a chart. So I think that's helped. Very Excellent. Do, uh, now, do you guys have a, a, a so-called CDO? Are you the equivalent of a, of a chief data officer? Or how um, about that role within the organization? Yeah. Um, Steve Muir, our senior vice president of comparative data and um, informatics, would probably serve as the closest as our chief data officer. Uh -huh. uh, he's more on the strategic end, I'm more on the operations end with that. But we do have a whole data team um, that's then headed up um, under Steve and myself that you know, really uh, focus on the data integrity type piece of things. So yeah, we do have a structure that's fairly similar to our members. And is it, is it is that role sort of, I mean, how is it evolving? Is it relatively new, and where do you see it going? Um, I think the role has been, you know, fairly stable other than, you know, in dealing with the multiple data sources. I think our biggest challenge, um, our databases have grown up just like the hospitals. So we have a database for the hospitals. We have a database for the, the faculty practice or the, you know, physician professional fee data. 
until uh, recently, those two databases were not able to talk with each other and contractually were even contracted by separate entities even within some of our same members. Um, so I think the, the role of the uh, chief data officer is really, let we've, we've the cleanliness of the data, the data integrity, we've really set up some really good solid processes that's now more maintenance, now more of the challenge is how do we bring data from different data streams together and keep that same high quality together and linking of databases? Yeah, and that's a challenge we've talked about earlier today about when you start yeah. bringing together different sources of data, that kind of, it can change the equation and, and, and evolving your data quality programs to, to uh, adjust to that is, is can be a challenge, but it's critical. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, one of the, um, uh, one of the evolving uh, technology areas, if you will, that we've been covering is the so-called industrial internet. Um, and around the idea of bringing data from industrial equipment, and, and that includes medical equipment, uh, into the equation when you're talking about analytics and, and in this case, a healthcare scenario. So bringing in data from your MRI machines, from your X-ray machines and other types of, uh, of equipment. What is your thoughts on that? Is that, I mean, it sounds like we're certainly at very early days, but increasingly these machines are, cre are creating more and more data. Some of them have sensors on them, things like that. Um, potentially even patients themselves are, are creating data there. They've got sensors on them. What, uh, I'm just curious, as a, again, as a practicing physician and you're a physician at UHC, how do you see that evolving and, and does that offer, I guess, probably both potential benefits but also <laughs> complications as well? Yeah, it's absolutely a double-edged sword. Um, you know, I, some of the data that you can get from that is, is phenomenal. So even, you know, in the past when you had to rely on a, a nurse usually or a tech, you know, writing down a blood pressure and you could, in, even if they were entering it into an electronic health record, transposing a number could be huge. A machine mm -hmm. automating that number in, it is what the machine recorded. That being said, a lot of these automated machines that, uh, you know, will generate data points like every minute, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, give you tons of information. And um, the question is sometimes it's information overload. It's, you know, so if I had one abnormal blood pressure because of things I moved at that point in time, but everything else was normal, but that's sending an alert and sending the code team down to my bedside and I'm totally fine, that's problematic and actually causes a lot of false alarms which then cause fatigue and then when the real deal happens, people don't come. The other piece to, uh, you know, to that is, I think that data and the ability to have that data and download is great, but someone still, a human, needs to be looking at and uh, validating, do those numbers make sense? Because a lot of times I would see even, um, we had some of that early automation that dumped um, some of the vital signs in, and it was still within the thresholds but totally did not make sense. And so you know, mm -hmm. should there has to be a way to do some data cleanup. I think the opportunity for the home monitoring to be able to be um, sent to the doctor's office to see someone being compliant, again, I think is, an, or see how the medication's working, I think is great. What I, the challenge will be, can I get a, if I have that diabetic out there, I don't want or need or have time to look through 300 blood sugar sticks over a course of a you know, set time period. If it's able to then take that data and send me a trend that the person was compliant 99% of the time within the range that I set, mm -hmm. and I'm able to take that and digest it, I think the opportunity is great to manage more people aggressively outpatient and keep them out of the hospital and have better health healthcare outcomes. So I think. You're right, it's at the very early stages. I think there's opportunity. I think we have to be very leery of um, alert fatigue and garbage in, garbage out, and just not archive and keep every piece of data just because we have it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Excellent, all right. L listen, David Levine, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and uh, sharing your, your experiences, and, uh, and good luck going forward. Thank you, I've enjoyed uh, being right. with you guys. All right, pleasure to meet you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest. This is theCUBE and SiliconANGLE's coverage of the MIT Information Quality Symposium. I'm Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. We'll be right back. <laughs>